of Calvary Chapel. Would you guys stand with me? Let's sing of the Lord's love together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me. A sinner condemned on the clean. Sing that again. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. I'm marvelous, singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. sorrows and made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. We're singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. It's one more time, how marvelous. We're singing how marvelous. Your praise will ever be. 
be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan. You father the orphan. Your kindness makes us whole. You shoulder a weakness And your strength becomes our own You're making me like you You're clothing me in white Trading beauty for ashes For you will have your bride Free of all her guilt And rid of all her shame And known by her true that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips.
special night, huh? Man. So we're going to take our usual time to pray, uh, and I think uh, tonight would be wonderful to have all of our prayers directed toward Jesse and Chelsea. And I'll also say this, maybe uh, if there's uh, marriages that are here that are struggling or just need some help, maybe tonight would be a night for some recommitment of vows between husbands and wives, if you've been struggling, you've been at odds with each other, there's been arguing, maybe even on the way here, you were, no, I know that never happens on the way to church. Satan rides in the car with us to church, right? So look, but we're not here to play games, right? We're here to have a, a wedding, and we all know it's a lot easier to get married than it is to stay married. And that takes uh, prayer and commitment and work and the love of God in our lives. So uh, pray for Jesse, Chelsea, and if anybody here needs prayer, or you just want to come up and say, hey, let, as a couple, let's just go up before the cross and just let's recommit ourselves to the Lord and to each other. And we'll do that for the next few minutes. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. So if, if you were coming expecting a regular Bible study, we have an extra thing here tonight. I think everybody knows about it already. We, uh, Jesse and Chelsea are getting married. And so here is where we begin the wedding ceremony. if we can find the uh, bride and the bridesmaids, right? <laughs>
all stand. One look at you Chelsea to be married to Jesse. Now, before you sit down, we want to set a proper tone for this wedding, so we're here to celebrate together with Jesse and Chelsea, so you can just show them your approval with some celebration cheers and applause. That's awesome. You may, you may be seated. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful. I'm just thankful for these uh, two young folks, Jesse and Chelsea and Micaiah, and um, just their lives, Lord, and, and just the changes we've seen in them in the past year since we've known them. And we just pray, Lord, your blessings upon this service tonight, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome everybody. So, this is a very special event we're having here. We've never done, done, done a Bible study wedding ceremony together before, but on behalf of Jesse, Chelsea, and their families, we welcome everybody, and also a special welcome and hello to Jesse's family who's watching on live streaming, and anybody else who may be watching live streaming tonight. Um, some of you are kind of wondering why we decided to have a, a wedding on the Wednesday night Bible study, and that's a good question and involves sharing a little bit of history. As many of you know, about a year ago, Jesse and Chelsea were at a very difficult time in their lives, and they reached out to, through email and Facebook messages to about 30 or more churches in this area. And of all of those churches, one church happened to respond, and, and that was us. And I talked to, I remember talking to um, Jesse over the phone. It was, a Wednesday, it was a Wednesday, August the 6th, right? And uh, he was saying that they weren't able to go to church. The church was in Henrico. He worked on Sunday mornings, could not get to church. So I said, well, we have a Wednesday night service. He said, really? And I said, yes. So, so that evening, uh, Jesse and Chelsea both came, and they just embraced us. We embraced them. Uh, we kind of became, became their family, their church family. And it's just been an awesome, awesome time since then. Uh, so that is why we thought Wednesday night was very appropriate since it was a Wednesday night when they first came. And just the other day, Chelsea was telling me that she, she was reluctant to come that first Wednesday. They'd been to other churches before and had gotten criticized and judged because they, they weren't married. And so she was a little bit afraid to come but Jesse encouraged her to come, and I, we didn't criticize them. You know, we, we loved them. They were in a very difficult time. They needed somebody to come along beside to love and support them. They did not need judgment and, and criticism. And it reminds me about when I mean, Jesus, you know, he's talking to the religious leaders of his day, these people who tried to keep every little law they could. They would uh, give 10% of the herbs, the spices from their herb gardens. Can you imagine that, counting out the leaves? And they were so careful to keep the law. But Jesus said you need to learn to have mercy. And, and, and in John chapter 1, Jesus said, uh, well, Jesus didn't say this, but it was in John chapter 1, it says the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So this is grace and truth that we, want, we show these young folks and we want to show people the, the love of God, not, not a bunch of rules and, and that. Now, of course, they didn't need to get married, 
And, you know, as they came to know the Lord and walk with the Lord and be part of our family, um, they decided it was, it was time to do it, and that's what we're here to celebrate tonight. So they've committed their lives to following Jesus and want to set the example by joining together in holy matrimony this evening. So we're going to take a pause, and the bridal party can, can have a seat. And Pastor Steve is going to come up and deliver a message. I'm assuming it's going to be on marriage. <laughs> It's going to be on Jesus <laughs> and what he has to do and say about marriage. So this is fantastic. I mean, you know, what a story of redemption. Uh, what a story to watch as a couple. You know, which of us comes to the Lord having our act together, right? I mean, we, we've, we're growing. And part of that growth is seeing what God says in his word and then responding to what he says. And this ceremony is a response to the truth about what God says about marriage and about lives and about relationships and so uh, that's to me this is an awesome awesome thing to watch you guys continuing to grow in the Lord and uh, so I'm going to pray and if you guys have Bibles does anybody have like you thought because this is a wedding you didn't need to bring your Bible all right so if you have your Bible Ephesians chapter 5 if you want to follow along there's Bibles in the back and if you don't have one maybe the person next to you has one but I'm going to read it anyway so you can follow along. Does anybody want a Bible to read along in Ephesians 5? Some of y'all have that passage memorized already. Uh, it's common ground for those of us that know the Lord uh, that read over and over in the Word about uh, it's the, the most practical and lengthy discussion on marriage in the New Testament. So as you guys are getting your places, anybody else need a Bible that didn't get one yet? One over here for Mr. Eric. Anybody else? Okay, let's pray, and then we'll uh, have a word from the Lord. Lord, here we are, doing what you instructed us to do, enjoying the institution that you founded. We know your word says that marriage is God's institution, which he loves. And Lord, we just confess on behalf of our nation how we've taken it and derailed it for our own purposes. So we want to honor you by honoring the institution that you loved and celebrating marriage. Lord, what would we know about it if it wasn't from your word? Where would we even start to figure it out if we didn't have instruction from you and the power of your spirit? So Lord, teach us all tonight again. Just refresh our minds about what it is we are doing here, what it is that, that pleases you in marriage, and what it is that gives you glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. I don't have to tell you, you already know the statistics about marriage. You already know the difficulty. In fact, maybe you don't know the statistics of divorce are actually, uh, the number of divorces is actually decreasing. Did you know that? For a long time, we've kind of said off the cuff, well, it's 50%, roughly one out of every two couples that gets married uh, doesn't stay married. But that's the number, from what I've read, is decreasing not because people are staying together, but because they're choosing not to get married at all. And people are taking marriage uh, more casually. They're, they're choosing to live together, see if it works out, and never actually go through the ceremony of tying their lives together legally and publicly. And, uh, and, and experts study why that is, and those that, uh, that look into those things have found, and one of the things they've said is that uh, the issue now is that it's got so hard because expectations are so high. In other words, and, and I find this in general uh, life relationships as well, people have very high expectations about what others will do for them. And so in a marriage, the expectation that you will fulfill as my spouse, you'll fulfill my deepest desires, you'll fulfill my need for recreation, my need for enjoyment, my need for feeling needed, whatever it might be, you'll fulfill those needs for me. And then two, two people come into this relationship with these expectations and find that, well, the other person doesn't meet those expectations and the whole thing begins to unravel. Expectations are what many are saying is the problem. I think the problem is different. I think the problem is that people don't know what marriage is about in the first place. I think we need to talk to the one who designed it to figure out what do we do with this thing. I mean, whoever 
builds a house without plans? Who would be silly enough to endeavor to create something and not have a set of plans to work from? And so we get into marriage, and many people get into marriage with expectations and what it's going to be like, and then, but they don't really know what it's supposed to be about or what the purpose of it is in the first place. And so we don't have to be uh, surprised that it comes crashing down for many, many people. Although one out of every two couples roughly uh, gets divorced, do you know that that doesn't have to be that way? You know, that if a couple goes to church together, they share the same faith, they read their Bible together, they pray together, they fellowship together, it's one in a thousand that get divorced when a couple does those things together. Well, Ephesians chapter 5, as I said, is, is probably the, the most comprehensive passage from the Bible on the topic of marriage. And the things that we're going to read here over the next few minutes are, are really things that make for good relationships in general. I mean, we're going to talk about submission. I know we love that word, don't we? Submission. But the Bible says that as part of the body of Christ, we're to be submitted to each other. There's a mutual yieldedness in our lives as Christians that we want to help other people have what they want. Like we die to ourselves and we uh, enjoy embracing what other people want. You know, helping them have their needs met. Not just coming selfishly to have our own needs met. And so the idea of submission, yielding to one another, placing ourselves under other people in an orderly fashion is not just for marriage. It's for life. It's for relationships. Whenever two people want their way and each is trying to get their way, you have a power struggle and it ends poorly. But when two people come to a relationship and say, oh, no, no, you have it your way. Oh, no, no, I couldn't. You have it your way. No, no, really, really, I want you to have what you want. Then, then everybody wins, right? If that's really what you want. Well, let's read a little bit and then we'll talk more about uh, some of these things. So I'll pick up in verse 22 and I'll just read the first two verses. They're geared toward uh, Paul addresses wives first. So you could read Chelsea. When I read wives, you can just read Chelsea in there. Uh, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Or as I said, we could say, verse 22, Chelsea, submit to Jesse as to the Lord. Reads differently that way, doesn't it? Makes it a little more personal. Now, I've just read out of the middle of the book of Ephesians, uh, so we don't really have the context. It's not like Paul just decided to sit down and write about marriage. What's the context? Why is Paul talking, the writer of this book is a man named Paul, and why did he start writing to wives about submitting to their husbands? Well, if you go back a little bit in that chapter, Paul is talking about what it looks like to be a spirit-filled Christian, to live a spirit-filled life, a life filled with the Spirit of God. And all he's doing is just showing us how that applies to various relationships in our lives, how it looks like to be a Spirit-filled wife, what it looks like to be a Spirit-filled husband. And then he goes on to Spirit-filled children, Spirit-filled fathers and parents, Spirit-filled workers, and Spirit-filled employees or slaves. And so all of this is in the context of, if, if you say, Lord, fill me with your Spirit, how many of you have prayed that? Oh, Lord, I want you to fill me with your spirit. Well, now you can know what that looks like, what you're asking God for. We're going to talk to the wives first. So the, see, he, he identifies who he's speaking to, wives. So these are women that started out as young girls, watching movies, fantasizing about marriage and the man on the white horse coming to take the princess away to the castle and live happily ever after. When we read about wives, we know how that vision starts, how that dream starts. Wives, this vision you have, this dream you have, this princess fairy tale thing, and then you meet him, and he's going to be the one to fulfill all of those dreams. And then reality happens, and he ain't no cowboy on no white horse, right? <laughs> 
It's, uh, but then you realize you ain't no princess either. So we recognize that when we talk about marriage, we are seeing that God in the beginning said, you know, the man shall leave his mother and father and be joined, glued to, intimately connected to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And by the next chapter, the whole thing's come unraveled. God creates family, and then sin happens. And after that, we have sinners marrying sinners. We have people that have struggle against their, their selfish nature marrying other people that struggle against the selfish nature, and we wonder why it's so hard. And in ourselves, we don't have the capacity to fix it. And that's why he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. As to the Lord. That's a really important phrase. You see, because God designed marriage. And he designed it in such a way that we've got two people, husband and wife. Are they equal, church? Is one superior and one inferior in terms of importance? No. They were men and women created both in the image of God. So when we talk about and use the word submission, we have to be careful of letting our hackles go up too quickly because our culture says, hey, wait a second, we live in the day where that was cultural then. It was a patriarchal society. That was cultural. And now, you know, I am woman. Hear me roar. And, and now things are different. That can't still apply. This whole wives submit to your husbands. As the That's old school. That's old fashioned. That's a different culture. Now, wait a second. How many of you understand and have read your Bible that Ephesus, remember I said this is the book of Ephesians. Ephesus was the center of the worship of, does anybody remember what goddess? the goddess Artemis or Diana. And did you know that according to mythologic history that the city of Ephesus was founded by none other than the Amazonian women. These warlike women were the founders of Ephesus according to their ancient mythology. So you have when Paul writes this, he's writing it into a very feminine dominant culture with the primary deity of their city, the primary worship being centered around women. So don't you think that this is any less radical to us today than it would have been to the audience that Paul was writing to. And so he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. You see, God designed marriage to equal people, both created in his image, not one better at it than another. Look, how many of you know, guys, how many of you know your wife is pretty capable of some things? I mean, she could probably do a better job at running the household than you could. I mean, I'm, I'm going to stand with you guys. Like my wife, she, you know my wife. She's an ice hockey player. And she builds stuff, like churches and things. And when we got married, you know, I would, you, you guys know my story. My parents, they had done a lot of things for me. And I didn't really know how to do a lot of stuff for myself. I was, I'll use the word mama's boy. Okay, it's out of the bag. <laughs> But they, they, they were helping me. They wanted to help me along. And so my wife had all this practical experience. And she had, she had started her own business. She owns a corporation, you know. And I don't even know how to buy a car. <laughs> and so we meet. And it just, fell, it just falls right in place. I'm labor. She's management. <laughs> and, but we were both walking with the Lord. And so we're trying to sort this stuff out. You know, this is, this is the, the way that we sort things out. Like the world tells us, hey, you know what? In any relationship, you got to get what you can. You got to fight for your needs. You got to fight for what you want. And he says, wives, submit, to your, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. You see, the Lord designed it. And so for, for women, when, when you embrace this willing yieldedness, I call it willing yieldedness. Like that means that when you're driving in the circle in Palmyra, and someone else is kind of merging there with you, you don't go out and try to cut them off. You yield to them. You have, there's a yield sign there. It's not a stop sign, by the way. Just saying. I have to mention that. It's a yield sign. That means you wait so the other one can go first. You let them go first. And there's two ways to do that, right? You can do it willingly, or you can do it out of obligation and resentment. Now, we'll come back to that in a minute. But let me just say, I want to bring back to the women, 
when you embrace that in your marriage, that I am going to yield to my husband to let him be uh, the leader of the home, it's the way God has designed it, then you're, you're submitting yourself to God's design. You're saying, God, I recognize this is the way you have designed it. So by submitting, by yielding in this way, I am actually yielding to God and his design for marriage. Now, some of you know that, you've, that you can sometimes look at a thing and know how to use it by the way it's built, right? I mean, you know that a hammer is not meant for driving screws. And we get into trouble when we take a tool and we misuse it. We break it, we put too much tension on it, we put, put too much stress on it in the wrong place. Well, I have a couple pictures. Nick, we have the pictures ready? Now look, here's one instance of the misuse of a tool. Do we, can we get that up there? All right, now there's a bad use. Now that's a car. It's got a certain purpose, get you point A to point B, but it's being used as a pickup truck. And what happened to the car? It's broken. All right, I got one more for you. Let's look at one more picture. That's a misuse. <laughs> I did, that picture was not taken in Fluvanna County that I know of. But the point is <laughs> that if you want a stool or chair, get a stool or chair. That is not for that purpose. You see, you have to know how a thing is designed so you can submit to its proper use. Okay, you can take those pictures down. I don't know the rest of that story, but how many of you would agree that was a bad idea? That is just a bad idea. But look, we laugh, and I want to, make, I want to have fun with this to make a serious point. That's what happens to marriage when we miss use it. We don't understand the proper use, the proper order, the proper design, and then we misuse it, and we wonder, well, people think it's the marriage, the institution of marriage that's broken. That's the problem. Marriage just doesn't work anymore. It's outdated. It's dysfunctional. It's, it's marriage is the issue. And I say, wait a second. Marriage is just fine. We just don't know how to use it right. You see, because when a woman says, well, I'm going to marry this guy, well, yeah. I tell this story, I'll tell it tonight, you guys already know it, but when, when you come down into this church, and Chelsea, here, there she is, the bride, and she enters into the room and she sees the aisle, and then she looks up, and well, we don't have one, we've got an arbor, but usually there's an altar here, yet she sees the aisle, and then she sees the altar where she's going to give her vows and exchange vows with her husband. And then she sees him standing right next to the altar. She sees the aisle, she sees the altar, and she sees him. And that becomes her motto for the rest of her life. Aisle, altar, him. <laughs> aisle, altar, him. <laughs> but isn't that true? I mean, I... I have this conversation all the time. I, have, I do way more marriage counseling than I'd like to do. And it never fails. Two people, husband and wife, they join themselves. And inevitably, uh, by the time they come to counseling, the roles have switched. She is now in mother role and he is in child role. You see, she's had, instead of, husband, instead of her being his wife and listening to what he wants to do. You know, you're created differently. Husbands and wives, we operate differently. We think about things differently. We, and, and someone has to be in charge. Someone has to be the head. And so we recognize that the majority of our problems are not the extreme issues. The majority of the fights we have are about stupid little things. Because I wanted to do it this way, and you wanted to do it that way, and you wanted it your way, and when we got married, you said you were going to do this, and you would do that, and, and I thought you meant this, and so now I'm trying to change you to make you do what I think you should be. It doesn't say, wives, resist your husbands, as to the Lord. Does that work? Wives, change your husband, as you would the Lord. No, 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 that doesn't work either. Try to fit anything else in there, and it just doesn't work. And, and the relationship begins to morph as she holds very high expectations for him, and that, that he should, when she says, or when he says, uh, honey, 
what do you want me to do? And she says, well, you can do whatever you want. What she means is, you better do what I want you to do, but I'm not going to tell you what I want you to do. You've got to figure it out, and when you get it wrong, I'm going to hold it against you. That's how that really kind of works out, right? And so she begins to hold expectations for him, which he continues to fail. He begins to retreat. He's falling out of love, is what would be the words that would be used. He's beginning to fall out of attraction because she's trying to control. She's trying to form him into her image. And she's become the mother role. And then when she, he doesn't perform to her expectations, then he gets punished. And the whole thing begins to devolve. And then we're in the office trying to unravel. Wait, this is, you're his wife, not his mother. Wives, submit yourselves as to the Lord. I know all of the complaints, and I know all of the discussions and all of the difficulties, but I'm guaranteeing you it is just not your job to change him. That is God's job. And, the, and he will try. He will try to please you. And every time he fails, his heart will constrict and not be able to hold as much love for you. And eventually what you have is the thing becoming unraveled. And what you have is growing in his heart instead of love for you is resentment. Because he's trying to please you and you're not pleasable and it's never enough and he begins to withdraw and resent. The only way to turn that around is to say, you know what, look, Lord, I'm going to submit to him because you designed marriage, Lord, and I'm trusting you. I'm not trusting him. I'm trusting you. And I'm going to yield myself willingly to come under to encourage, to be his helper, to help.